There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel and another uh, medium sized book haul. I've been doing wee book hauls for weeks. They don't seem to be getting as many hits as when I did larger book hauls, so I may have to abandon that format. Because I'm all about the hits, you know. <laughs> As a decrepit old booktuber pushing 60. And so maybe this is a little experiment to see if uh, doing six books instead of three gets more attention. Maybe my wee book hauls are too wee. But also I didn't get a book, a wee book haul up this week. So this will be kind of double duty for this past week and the week, the week, the current week. So without further ado, let's just dive in. What are these six books, Sean? Um, some of these are going back months and months. I have such a backlog. I have a whole shelf for my book haul <laughs> books that haven't been hauled yet. And here's one that I've had for, goodness, maybe close to a year. It is my own personal copy of the fabulous Irish novel or novella, What Willow Says by Lynn Buckle. It was published in 2021 by Epoch Press. I reviewed this on my channel in time, so I read an arc and re my book review went up on the pub date. And then later on, I interviewed the author, Lynn Buckle, on my channel. And I've interviewed her at least twice, maybe more. Lynn Buckle is a deaf author. And this is an incredible story about a deaf girl, I think she's seven or eight, and her hearing grandmother who is struggling to learn sign language so that she can communicate better with her granddaughter, who she seems to be the guardian of, if I remember correctly. But she certainly has her in her care a lot. And they invent their own way of communicating beyond the sign language that the grandmother is struggling to, to, to learn. And it's all about nature, and they kind of connect through nature. And the title is What Willow Says, which is about the granddaughter's request that her hearing grandmother teach her, show her, communicate to her what the willow trees sound like when the wind is blowing through their branches. It's just beautiful. And I didn't have my own copy until quite recently. The entries are short. The first one is very short. Some of them are two, three or four pages and they're kind of like diary entries. So I'm going to read the first entry to you in full. Entry number one. And there's kind of a weather forecast at the beginning of each entry. Wind, force zero to seven in 10 seconds. Weather, fine, dry, which is a jubilant sign. Outlook, good. We struggle to hear in our household. Age, degeneration, oral complications and congenital conditions. Ignorance. We have confusing discussions, mistaken arrangements, and fights over hearing aid batteries. Plus, the convenience of not hearing when it suits us. Now we are trying to listen to each other and to trees. There is so much that we have never heard. So little time to hear it. This much is true just exquisite. I think this one might have won a National Book Award or something. I don't follow the prizes at all anymore. But I know it was nominated for something. It might have won something. Uh, and it's a queer novel. It came out last year by Justin Torres, Blackouts. And it's a gorgeous specimen of a book. I remember when I went to the bookstore up the street and they had one copy left and the, there was some little crinkle on the dust jacket. And I said, no, I need a pristine copy. So they specially ordered it for me. And here it is months and months later on red, but I will be reading it very soon and I'll keep you in suspense as to why. This is one of the gayest books ever published, I believe, and it has a lot to do with gay history. Maybe a lot of the story is about the author or the history of this book, Sex Variants, A Study of Homosexual Patterns, which I'm sure I read or tried to read many years ago. A kind of experimental book, which I've heard mixed reviews of, but which, and just a but just beautiful pages. <laughs> And all kinds of photographs and illustrations and and the font itself is in that same what would you call it kind of a rust tone a brown tone i cannot wait to find the oh i won't show you that one <laughs> i can't show you a lot of the pictures but yeah there's lots of them in there and blackouts obviously has something to do with the blacked out text and so on i read justin torres's debut novella i think it's a novella we the animals a few years ago and loved it which is why i was so excited for this i can show you this picture it's not x-rated so this is the first picture in the book 
And now I'm going to read you the first opening paragraph. I came to the palace because the man I sought kept a room there. He stood at the point of egress, supporting himself against the door frame, not just thin, but skeletal, lips shrunken and chapped, the skin of his face pulled taut over the scroll. I led him back to the bed, where he looked at me, kind yet wild. His eyes burned with life, as if the spirit had left the flesh and concentrated there, in irises bright and glassy, the milk of the whites unsullied. His voice, though fey, came hale and lucid, and when he spoke he did so without obstruction, no wheezing, no confusion, that is, until the final hours, when he slipped into delirium, speaking nonsense and quoting from literature. I told him I would stay, play bad nurse, however long it took. The truth is, I had nowhere else to go, and both of us knew as much. Juan insisted that, after his death, I remain in the palace and take over his room. He asked that I finish the project that had once consumed him, the story of a certain woman who shared his last name, Miss Jan Gay. Come, he said with a wink, squeeze mother's hands as a sign you will do it. This was an allusion to some famous scene I could not place. It was not a joke. I took his hands, all knuckles and finger bones, into my own. He was near death, and I would have promised him anything. Well, that certainly grabs my attention. Have you read this? I'm not sure where in Britain this author lives, so I will describe her as a British writer. Orla Owen, and this is maybe her second novel, came out earlier this year, Christ on a Bike. I had to verify that Jesus Christ was not a character in this novel, and once I was assured that he wasn't, I ordered it. Kofari Madavan has raved about it on my channel, and I am really curious. So Christ on a bike is, is just kind of an exclamation, kind of a swearing expression, like um, Jesus Christ, right? That kind of an expression. So the protagonist, a woman named Sarah, she receives an unexpected inheritance, and there are rules attached. And it came out uh, just a few months ago from Blue Moose Books, who is also the publisher of Ronan Hessian's books. Here's the first two short opening paragraphs. When the hearse pulled up outside the house, Sarah knew it was real. Gwen was gone. Until it appeared, she hadn't been sure, but that's the way of an unexpected death. The grief muddles usually clear thoughts. Before Sarah saw the brown wicker box inside the glossy black car, she thought it must all be a terrible mistake. And she would definitely get to see Gwen again one day. She wished the front room was empty so she could fall to her knees and weep like a lady in a film from the olden days, when hair was hot-ironed into waves and people were slim because of the war, the walking everywhere, the home-cooked meals rather than the fast food burgers and sugar, sugar everywhere. But it was the new days, so she stayed standing up. Her knees buckled. Nausea rose when she swallowed down, so well practiced at keeping things just about under control. Well, that is a marvelous opening, and I can't wait to get to this. Here is a debut queer African novel, Blessings. I'm, I'm having trouble pronouncing the name. I've listened to it online, but it's spoken so fast, I'm not sure I've got it. Anyway, the novel is called Blessings by Chekwa Buka Ibe, who is a queer Nigerian writer, and this is a debut, and there's been all kinds of buzz about it. It's been one of the most heavily promoted buzzy books that I've seen in recent months, and I hope it's all worth it. What a gorgeous cover. The protagonist's father catches his teenage son in the act, and all hell breaks loose and plot ensues. Opening paragraph. In October, he came. His arrival was without forewarning, without ceremony. A slight rap on the door that mild evening, just as the son was making a final appearance before retiring, and there he was, in his bathroom slippers, hefting a Ghana must go sack on his shoulders, next to Obiofuna's father, Anozi, both looking weary from the long travel. When Anozi had talked about getting an extra hand to assist in the shop, Obiofuna had not known what to expect, but somehow it was not the tall figure who now stood hugging his bag to his chest, a slight downturn to his lips as he stared at his dusty feet. He towered a foot above Obiofuna's notably tall father, but it was the even darkness of the boy's skin that made Obiufuna's eyes linger on him a while longer when he opened the door to let them in. The boy seemed undecided whether to follow Anozi inside or turn and head back the way he had come. He stepped in after a moment's hesitation, tactfully shrugging off Obiufuna's attempt to help him with his load. Well, I like the sound of that so far. Next is a Canadian novel from the Saskatoon publisher Thistledown Press. 
who have published David Carpenter, some of David Carpenter's works, and Sharon Butala's last novel. And this one was published four years ago, in 2020, and I didn't know anything about it or the author, but when I read about it, I thought, I need to read this book and hopefully interview its author. It's called Ivy's Tree by Wendy Burton. What a lovely cover. Speaking of covers, it is about a 70-year-old widow. I'm wondering, is widow even politically correct anymore? I don't know. Anyway, that's how she's described in the synopsis. She's 78, and her daughter has summoned her to Tokyo. I don't know any more details about why. Her husband had only died recently. So she's coming to terms with all of that. Moving to Tokyo alone, but her daughter's there, and they have a difficult relationship. What else do you need to know? And so it's like, isn't it obvious? I love books with older women characters, and it's set in Tokyo, most of it. So, oh, this just sounds fabulous. Wendy Burton. I think she might live in British Columbia. She doesn't live in Saskatoon. Wendy Burton has written short stories, novels, and lots of academic and not creative nonfiction writing. I believe this is her first published book. And I actually don't know where she lives, but I don't think it's Saskatoon. I seem to remember hearing it was BC. Anyway, I'll find out more about her. But I'm actually planning to read this, you know, fairly soon because, just because. Here is the opening paragraph. Ivy sits on a hard plastic chair at the U Street Clinic. Holding a Chatelaine magazine closed in her lap, she peers through plastic-framed reading glasses at the clipboard-supported patient information sheet. Still reluctant to check Widow... Still considering herself married, she tries to remember the names of the drugs she takes every day, before every meal, at waking and going to bed. Synthyroid, an unpronounceable one for cholesterol. Periot, for acid reflux. High blood pressure medication. A diuretic. Iron, calcium, vitamins. Little blue pills. Big beige horse pills. Two white pills that are identical, except for a faint H on one of them. An H she can barely see, and sometimes imagines she sees. As she imagines the thread through the needle's eye when she's replacing a button or mending. Well, I absolutely love that opening. And finally, this will be my next buddy read with Heidi of My Reading Life. And this book was person not personally, this book was recommended to me by the wonderful novelist Amina Kane as one of her most anticipated books coming out this year. The author is Susan Scanlon, and the title is Committed on Meaning and Mad Women, a memoir. It was just published about a week or two ago, and there's been all kinds of rave reviews about it here, there, and everywhere. Susan Scanlon has written two works of fiction, and she's been published in a lot of other places. Here is the opening three paragraphs. One of them is average length, and the other two are very short. The first chapter is entitled Return. It was a hot July day, many decades later, that I happened to be in New York. I was house-sitting for a friend, spending a week in her apartment at 145th and Broadway. It was the closest I'd been in years to the hospital that had once been my home. One morning I decided to walk north. My best days are those that I walk the city, unfettered and directionless, and so it took me a minute to understand where I was going. We are drawn back, aren't we? even when we don't mean to be and don't want to be. The past is there, waiting for us. I walked the mile or so up Riverside Drive until I reached my once address, 722 West 168th Street. Of course, nothing in this city remains as it was, and this is no exception. The building, with, with its grand architecture, is no longer the home of the State Psychiatric Institute. Now it is home to Columbia University's School of Public Health. This is where I lived, I want to say to someone, as I point up to the fifth floor. But who would care? Well, I'm going to be starting this in the next few weeks, and I can't wait. Which of these appeal to you? Which of these have you read? Thanks for watching.